A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a judge in California has been charged with murdering his wife and then sending a text to his co-workers that said, quote, I just lost it. I shot my wife. I won't be in tomorrow. Not kidding you. The judge, who was traded in his black robe for an orange jumpsuit, says it was an accident. But will the jury believe him after that incriminating text? But first, a young soldier who pleaded with the public to help find his missing wife is now charged with her murder. Police in Alaska say that they were newlyweds. They had just celebrated his 21st birthday. The wife's body was found in a drainage ditch with a bullet to the head. We are recording this on Wednesday, August 16th of 2023. Our guest today is Renee Cummings, a criminal psychologist and criminologist. Renee is also the professor of practice in data science at the University of Virginia. Renee is new to our podcast. I want you all to welcome her. Welcome, Renee. How are you? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Renee, since you're new to the podcast and, you know, our, our regular listeners love to know everyone's area of expertise, can you tell us just a little bit um, about the area that that you are, you know, most passionate about? I think when it comes to criminal justice, I'm passionate about the entire pipeline. I'm passionate about the investigations, but I think I'm most passionate about justice. And justice is also the work that led me to data science and artificial intelligence, where I am now at the University of Virginia School of Data Science. So everything uh, pertaining to lawmaking, lawbreaking, law enforcing, but ensuring there's always a particular attention to due process and the decision making around it. I have to be honest with everyone. I was watching Bloomberg because I'm a bit of a nerd (laughs) and I saw you and I texted everyone and said, oh, my God, we have got to get Renee on the program. Big fan. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, let's get to our cases here. They're they're quite serious. So our first case is out of Anchorage, Alaska, where a soldier is charged with killing his wife. Police and family say that the husband pleaded for help in finding his missing wife, that he even helped to search for her with the woman's mother, which to me is just, it is such a violation. I I realize that he is accused, presumed innocent, but to me there's such a violation, if indeed he did do this, that he was pretending to be worried and to be searching for his wife with the woman's mother and family. That to me is abominable. You know, when you think about that, it it really uh, paints a a very interesting picture when we think about the psychology that's sometimes behind some of these violent acts. And it really makes you wonder what is going on in the mind of the individual at that point. And much of my work as a, a criminal psychologist goes into the mind and the thinking and that wondering, uh, what is that individual feeling at that moment? To be there with a the mother, to be there with your mother-in-law, to be there with a mother who is, is at this moment searching for her daughter. And you probably at this point, knowing that her daughter is no longer alive, it could be shock. It just could be a really strange way of processing what has been done, or uh, sometimes it really speaks to the the kind of sort of like uh, psychosis often behind uh, murder. And I've seen this before in other cases, not a lot of them, but uh, another case sticks in my mind where the young man who ultimately was convicted in that other case held that mother held her hand, told her it would be okay. And it's that violation, of course, losing her daughter was horrific and she can never recover from that. But that extra violation that it just leaves you feeling just wrong about everything. It's it's just, it's like salt in the wound, I think, is the way I would yeah, describe that. Most definitely, most definitely. And I think uh, uh, for a mother uh, at that moment, uh, the so many things that are happening in the mind of that mother, of course, the hope of finding your daughter alive, 
but also the fear of knowing that there could be another uh, more deadly possibility. It really speaks to not only uh, a, a, a distrust of, of, of just this, this process in itself, but it really puts you in a place where you're just left just wanting on so many levels. Yeah, absolutely. So we are talking here about the accused killer who is 21 years old and his name is Zarius Hildebrand. The victim in this case, also 21 years old, his new bride, Saria Barry Hildebrand. Now the two met in basic training. They married less than a year ago in December of 2022. He was in the, she was in the Alaskan Army National Guard, but she had transferred over from Utah to be with him. And he was a soldier in the army in the second infantry brigade combat team. Again, very young people. Now, Saria had moved from Utah again to be with him. Her family was still there. And just to show you um, what a hardworking woman she was, young woman, she was a combat medic. Plus she had a second job. She worked at a restaurant called The Bread and Brew. So that says a lot about a young person to me always, you know, how hardworking she was. So on the night of August 5th, the couple went out to celebrate his 21st birthday, which I find really interesting. We recently had another case on the podcast where, and again, in that one just charged, it hasn't been adjudicated yet, went out to celebrate his birthday and then she ends up dead after the party. Do you think that there is just, I mean, how is a birthday party triggering of all things? Well, I will say this, you've got to ask yourself what happened at the party? There's so many variables and so many factors. And sometimes a, a party, which starts out to be a, a joyous occasion, often ends in something that is very, uh, very sad. And uh, in this case, something that's absolutely lethal and deadly. So you, you've got to think about that party. You've got to think particularly their age. You've got to think if there was something at that party that may have triggered some kind of misunderstanding. So we've got to think about this, a young man who's just turned 21. Uh, 21 sounds like a, a big number, but we all know it's an age where you're still trying to find yourself. It's a, an age when you're, you're still trying to figure things out, where you can still be very insecure as an individual, particularly with young men. We, we understand the psychology, particularly of young men who are moved, uh, who have that proclivity uh, to violence. There is some sort of insecurity in there as well. So it just leaves you wanting to find out more and wanting to understand if it was some sort of misunderstanding that they took out of the celebration and into the home. Well, I'm afraid we don't know the answer to that one yet. We don't. The details are still emerging. So police say that the couple got home around 2 a.m. And this now would have been August 6th, though so technically the next calendar day. And Zarius told police that the two were so hungover that Saria decided to walk to work that morning. She was supposed to be at the restaurant. Now, Zarius allegedly told authorities that Saria left the couple's home between 9 and 10 a.m. on the morning of the 6th for a shift at the Bread and Brew. And according to Zarius, his wife, this is interesting, and it will become even more interesting in a, in a minute when we reveal more evidence, alleged evidence here, that the wife left her phone at home, but she took her purse and wallet. Okay, now one could make an argument here, Renee, that if they were truly hung over, right, it is possible that you could not have yourself all together. And, you know, we've done that. We've all left our cell, cell phone at home and then get in the car and turn around. And if you're walking, that's too far. It's possible until something happens later, right? Well, you know, here I am thinking you pick up your purse, you pick up your wallet, but you leave your phone. And when we're thinking about this age group, 21 years old, you're pretty much attached to that phone. Uh, you know, the phone is, is your life. Much of the socializing happens on the phone. The phone is such a, a critical aspect. And then I'm also thinking of someone who is a medic, someone who understands urgency and connection and being connected. Uh, that phone is so critical. You know, you can be getting a, a message from the job. You can be getting a message from your mom. There could be so many things happening. So leaving the phone home is something that kind of put a big question mark for me. 
Absolutely. I agree with you. I'm just tossing in that possibility. If the story were true that they were both hung over, that could be plausible. However, evidence will <laughs> reveal itself in just a few minutes. Now, he says he went to pick up Saria around 7 p.m. that evening, and that's when for the first time ever, he says he learned that she didn't show up for her shift. So now he says he's so worried, um, you know, he's He's calling all her friends and family. He's trying to reach out to her. And he said he drove around the neighborhood. He said he for sure contacted um, the parents in Utah. He says he called the hospitals and that he even called the local jail. Interesting. Interesting. Boy, what a together 21-year-old, right? <laughs> Well, he certainly did a lot of calling there, but uh, <laughs> what I want to know, what I'm thinking about is if she left that phone home and you did not make any contact with her for several hours until you went to pick her up at the job, uh, something there is just not connecting. I don't think given the age group, given uh, the relationship the age group usually has with the cell phone, with the internet, with social media, with just about staying connected, I cannot see such a long space of time passing and he doing, you know, just having that phone there and then going to pick her up. It's just not adding up for Correct, me. because you would normally, if you saw the cell phone, if you couldn't get down there during her shift, when you went to pick her up, you'd say, honey, you left your cell phone at home. Your mom's been trying to reach you, something like that, right? But that's well, not- Or usually you call from the job and say, hey, did I leave my phone at home? Because eventually you're going to figure out I don't have my phone on me. Exactly. 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 And how interesting that they would not have talked for all those hours. Newlyweds. Really? Something. There's always something to talk about. Always. Always. Now, the New York Post reports that he posted a desperate message on Facebook that night. He said he even they said they even he even made a missing persons poster with her photo on it and asked everyone to share it because it was urgent. The next day, on August 7th, Zarius reported his wife missing to the police. So this would have been about 36 hours after the time he says she left the house for work. So police and volunteers, more than 60 of them, search the mile long route from their home, their apartment to her work. Makes perfect sense. That's a logical place to look, right? Because if something's going on or, or something happened to her or it was an accident, there should be a clue along this path. Nothing. They didn't find anything. In fact, her mother, who had come in from Utah to Alaska, was helping with the search. Uh, her, her mother says that the son-in-law, um, she searched for her daughter with her son-in-law. And the mother told the post, quote, he walked around for hours with me searching for my daughter, knowing that she was dead. He lied to me multiple times and tried to play it off as he was the concerned husband. That to me, it's, it's morally criminal. Definitely. But it's also something we've seen, as you alluded to earlier, before in very similar cases, that concern, that being by the side of other family members, going to the media, putting out content in the media, uh, looking as though you're involved, uh, looking as though you are uh, the loving, caring husband, looking as though you are, you know, as you know, not knowing uh, what is happening. But again, to me, it, it really comes with a kind of performance that we have seen that is really, really devoid of any kind of sensitivity, uh, morality, or just that kind of humanness uh, that is uh, so required. Renee, do you, you know, the flip side to that is if he's not involved in the search, if he's not concerned or worried, that will be incredibly suspicious as we've seen in other cases where the person is ultimately charged. Well, I think if you're not concerned and you're not worried and you're not doing it, the obvious is, could you be guilty? But then we also know if you're too involved, too concerned, too there and pretending to be too much of that loving husband, that's always a concern. So, so that's the flip side. And I think that 
in between uh, those two opposites is where most people, you know, find themselves in trouble. Police interviewed some of her co-workers who claim that they, the co-workers, received a text from Saria around 10.45 a.m. that morning that she didn't show up for her shift. Now, hold on a second. That phone is at home with the husband. How can a text message have been sent by the wife? Ding, 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 as I say on the evidence. That, to me, is very, very damning. Well, it, it's, it's very telling, and it's, it's just part of this uh, script uh, that sometimes uh, alleged perpetrators uh, sort of uh, write psychologically. Uh, they write this script in their head as to how things are supposed to look. Uh, but when you're looking in from the outside, you're seeing all the holes in uh, this performance. The performance is not as coherent as they think uh, it is actually looking. Uh, where does the text come from, from a phone that's been uh, left home? A phone that you didn't really pay any attention to because it was there resting, uh, you know, all day. And mm -hmm. uh, until you went, I think it was, you know, after work to get your wife. So very that that to me was very suspicious. So investigators then interview the husband in the couple's apartment and police say that they asked him where he was on Sunday, the day that his wife disappeared and that he allegedly gave conflicting stories. According to police, Zarius first told investigators that he stayed home all day uh, nursing that hangover of his. But then he later told officers that he had to run some errands prior to going to pick up his wife. And police allegedly saw two pistols in the home on the kitchen table. OK, you know what? If they were legally obtained, that's not necessarily a big deal. Correct. So along with that, police noticed that there was a new set of sheets Officers noted that the only bed, which would have been their bed, appeared to be missing sheets and that it was only covered by a mattress pad. And so, again, they thought that was very strange. They asked Zarius, the husband, if they could lift up the mattress pad to check for signs of the wife. And he allegedly told police there were embarrassing items underneath that he didn't want them to see. He later said it was of a sexual nature. I don't think that's what he may have been embarrassed about. Well, you know, when we think about, of course, uh, a young couple, we think about the age. Uh, we're not thinking about all of those other things that he wants us to think about. But I think you're quite correct. Uh, he may not have been embarrassed by those things, but he probably knew what law enforcement was about to see. Yes. So then police say that they asked Zarius about those texts that were sent from his wife's phone on the day of her disappearance. Um, and he allegedly denied that he was the one who sent them. And he also had no explanation for how those messages could have possibly been sent from her phone if her phone had been left in the apartment all day. He had no answer for that. Okay, so then the cops talk to neighbors. Now it gets more interesting. And one neighbor says that they heard a gunshot at around 2.45 a.m. This would be on August 6th, but the neighbor didn't go out to investigate. However, according to police reports, officers were dispatched to the area and they didn't see anything suspicious. Now, I can't very much blame the police here because this is an apartment complex. So what are you going to do, knock on everybody's door? Well, that's it. And you, you hear a gunshot and a gunshot is something environmental. It's also something uh, they may be thinking that's happening on the outside. And then you come to an apartment complex that's probably looking very quiet and you're probably thinking it didn't really happen, you know, in there. So I think, as you said, you, you cannot blame law enforcement. You can also can't blame the neighbor. You know, you hear something at that hour. You may not want to open your door and step outside to, to do any kind of uh, your own investigation because it, it really, these are different times. You know, these are, are very dangerous times. You're right, Renee. I'm not going out there in my bathrobe, you know, and my baseball bat to figure out what's going exactly. on out there. And probably they didn't hear any commotion to go with it or any screaming or shouting or the kinds of noise that would alert you to maybe something more is happening. Absolutely. So um, this, of course, is is got 
investigators very concerned because there's a text message that was sent that's not making any sense. She didn't show up for work. That's not making any sense. This is a responsible young woman. That's the other thing, a responsible young woman. And now we have this gunshot. So, so too many things. So Anchorage police decide they're going to dig a lot deeper. And they say they discovered that Zarius was very busy. Uh, he allegedly went to a local store where he reportedly purchased a set of new bed sheets. Okay, it's possible if you're running errands. However, hydrogen peroxide and an empty spray bottle. Okay. Authorities also say that he purchased a 96 gallon garbage can along with a mop, a bucket, um, and those from the local Lowe's. Okay. All right. You know. It, it depends on whether things start to line up, but it's looking, it's not looking good here. So then authorities, and, we're, and we still haven't found the wife yet. Then authorities execute a search warrant on their apartment. And this is when they discover the most um, concerning of evidence. They say that the mattress was soaked with human blood so much that according to the criminal complaint, quote, there was so much blood on the mattress that the blood soaked through onto the carpet and into the wood frame. That's a lot of blood. It's a lot of blood, but for me, it began with the size of the garbage can, which is huge if you're living in an apartment building. Why do you need a garbage can that is so big? That comes to, you know, when you're thinking about that size, it's like you're living in a house. So that sort of like, you know, got me thinking. Of course, now when law enforcement uh, find that amount of blood, uh, there's not much else to say after that kind of find. Absolutely, and it also changes things. Like we've seen cases uh, where police have pursued charges where a body hasn't been found, and in those cases, when there doesn't seem to be any evidence that something bad happened to that person, it's a much harder case. But when police have blood evidence or indications of a struggle, it changes the outlook on whether the, it's possible that that person is still alive. So they also, police say they found blood on the floors of the home and all over the bathroom. Again, um, very concerning about whether it's even possible given that much loss of blood, if she could still be alive. Clearly, injured quite seriously at minimum, at minimum. So police now say uh, that all of this is an indication that he was trying to clean up what they say was the crime scene. Uh, police noted that there were two pistols recovered from the residence. One had a full clip and the other was missing around, which of course will be of huge um, interest in the event that she is found. So while searching the area around the couple's apartment building, then they found that 96 gallon trash can in the back where they keep all the landscaping equipment and the garbage can allegedly contained blood in it. So police have not filled in the gap of what was that can possibly used for and how it relates to our, our victim here. Do you think that that could have been used to transport her? Well, well definitely. Uh, the main thing is it had wheels on it and the size of it. So uh, when we think about uh, what the police uh, have presented so far, blood at different uh, spaces in uh, the home, uh, definitely there's that movement and uh, movement of, of, of individuals as well. And of course, eventually uh, where uh, the body is found, it, it it makes you realize that it had to be moved from point A uh, definitely to where it was eventually found. So most definitely, if you're thinking, you know, strategically about this case, there has to be some form of transport uh, and some form of movement. And I think the garbage can, the size of it, the wheels uh, just makes you, you know, think. Mm-hmm. Finally, on August 10th, four days after her disappearance at about six in the evening, officers discovered her body in a storm drain. They were using a search drone and officers say that they located a pillow in the drain along with something that looked large and white, like a human body, a Caucasian. And officers recovered her body along with blood on the rim of the storm drain. And it was later determined that she had been killed by a single gunshot to her left 
temple. They haven't told us anything about whether they have recovered the bullet or anything like that. And then that was it. Zarius was charged. He was charged on August 11th. He's charged with first degree murder, second degree murder, tampering with evidence. He remains in custody at the Anchorage Correctional Complex. And Saria's family would like to take her back to Utah for burial. Her parents were in the courtroom when he had his first appearance, presumed innocent until proven guilty, but just a really horrible case for both of these families, for both of them. For both families, definitely. And when you see cases like these, you're just left asking yourself, what moves an individual to this kind of violence, particularly someone is so young, particularly a young relationship. You know, you, you see the images, you see young people, you see the beautiful smiles, you see a future, a, a beautiful future that's absolutely cut short. And you ask yourself, what caused it? You know, what created this? What was this proclivity of this propensity uh, for any kind of violence in something that's supposed to be uh, a new start on life? So it, it really, really gets you thinking about, you know, violence, particularly intimate part of violence is something that you always ask yourself about. And of course, the insecurities that leads to one wanting to use violence, whether or not social, uh, whether or not any type of insecurity. And, and, and just it, it just leaves leaves a, you know, a, a very, a very sort of like sort of painful feeling, even as a criminologist and, and criminal psychologist, no matter how many of these you see, particularly when it's young life lost and two lives that may uh, end up being cut short. It really, really is something that's very, very troubling. Our next case is out of Anaheim, California, where a superior court judge has been arrested for murdering his wife and then sending his law clerk and the bailiff a text message saying that he won't be in court tomorrow because he just shot his wife. If that is not a confession, I do not know what is. Oh my gosh, Renee. Wow. 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 It, it, That's... <laughs> wow. Like there's so many things running through my brain about this one. Like one, you know, is this bravado? Is this like not thinking? Is this like looking at you know, the death of your wife as being inconsequential, like it's just an inconvenience to work. Like, what does this say about this man? Well, for me, it, it had me thinking about the history of, of this uh, couple, the history of this marriage. And, and when it culminates into something like death, you're asking yourself again, what kinds of violence, what kinds of traumatic situations, what kinds of, of uneasy situations existed in this home. And when you think of the age of, of this couple, and when you think of this kind of, of violence, and uh, when you think of uh, the kinds of uh, expressions of violence, particularly for someone who has worked in the uh, criminal justice system, particularly for someone who is supposed to have a certain kind of discernment and a certain kind of, of restraint and a certain kind of personality that comes with the position that they hold. And then you see something like this, you're asking yourself what broke down and for how long weren't things working uh, for I this know. couple? Why I found these two cases so interesting and to examine both of them with you is that you in each case you have a husband charged with murdering the wife after some kind of an argument but in the first case they're 21 years old in the second case he's 72 she's 65 and he is a criminal court judge and before that he was a prosecutor in the da's office this is a man who knows the law and and you could say in each case the alleged killer made some really foolish, dumb moves that revealed the possibility that they should be looked at as a suspect. And in the judge's case, he just admitted it and said it's interrupting his workflow the next day. You're quite correct. And when I think about the victims in both cases, uh, much of what we know when we think about violence, when we think about intimate partner violence, when we think about domestic violence, much of what we know before the violence actually happens is seen like a dress rehearsal for the violence. So when you think about it, 
uh, and you think about the ways in which uh, individuals express themselves violently, if it's a 21 year old or if it's a 70 year old uh, individual who has been uh, a member of the criminal justice system, you're looking at the mind of the individual. You're looking at what happens across the life course of the development of that mind. And why is it that some people are use violence or have that proclivity for violence and, and age is, is really not a factor. Uh, education, not a factor. Life experience, not a factor, because the end result in both cases has been the death of two women. Yeah, and I, I wonder if the judge was just so, to me, I see that as an act of arrogance. Well, I killed her, so I can't go to work tomorrow. Woman's an inconvenience. I, I see the arrogance of a short-tempered judge here. I think both could be viewed as arrogance. Both could be viewed as insecurity. Both can be viewed as, as individuals are having some level, uh, to me, of that kind of emotional immaturity, which is something that is usually linked to that kind of arrogance. And, and oftentimes when we think about arrogance, when we think about arrogance when it comes to the perpetration of violence, there are also narcissistic tendencies that have been revealed uh, when we think about individuals who are so emboldened uh, mm -hmm. to use violence in very, very uh, lethal ways. So we're talking about 72-year-old Jeffrey Ferguson, an Orange County Superior Court judge. He has been charged with murdering his 65-year-old wife, Cheryl Ferguson, in their Anaheim Hills home after some kind of argument. Now, despite that incriminating text that he said he killed his wife, the judge has entered a plea of not guilty, and he has been freed on $1 million uh, on a bail bond. Okay, so he's out. Um, they don't think that he's a flight risk, even though he's given up his passport. He has to wear an ankle monitor. We'll get into the details of it. One of the things I always find interesting, and then we discuss a lot about what is justice? What does it look like? We also look at justice in this part. So we have one young man up in Alaska is being held. And here we have a judge, someone who is considered a pillar of the community, okay, he may have a lot more financial resources, but he's out. And I always ask about, hmm, the first one is a young African-American man. The second is an older white man with privilege in the system. And I just wonder, did he get some special treatment to get out and not have to sit behind bars waiting trial like some others? Well, you know, we could look at it both ways. We could look at it as the justice system having its own challenges when it comes to justice. We can also look at it as the personalities of the individual. So you have a 72-year individual who has a long history of probably being a very upstanding citizen, uh, working in the criminal justice system. Of course, he has a house, he has finances, he has given up his passport, and the age is also a factor in there. So, of course, you know, in, in, in all circumstances, uh, those factors stack up and stack up in a very positive way. You have a young man in the military, uh, African-American, probably no kind of income, no kind of resources, no kind of connections to the community. Uh, so definitely would see be seen as uh, more of a risk, whether or not those are accurate depictions and accurate enough uh, data to really determine the levels of risk. That's the big question that we're seeing in the criminal justice system. The ways in which the data points stack up to determine who's a risk and who's not a risk is something that really needs drilling into in very, very real ways. I think so. And frankly, I would think that the judge has the resources to disappear. And if anyone has reason to disappear, it's the judge. That's just my thought. Because we've seen, well, we've seen people. The bolt. judge also has, I think, uh, adult children as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that also speaks to the family connections, the community connections, uh, whether or not someone who has lived all their life in a particular uh, community is uh, at his age probably going to, to try to flee. It has happened in some cases. We do know that. Whether or not it's going to happen in this case, well, I guess we're going to have to stay tuned. 
Yes, we will have to stay tuned on that. So according to prosecutors, the shooting occurred after an argument between Jeffrey and Cheryl on August 3rd. The argument apparently began in a restaurant. Everyone went out to dinner. The two cases are so similar. Go out to dinner, then come home. Um, Then the argument kind of continued on to the home when they got home. Now, according to the criminal complaint, at some point during the argument, and this was in the restaurant, I find this very disturbing and very chilling. The judge, Jeffrey, allegedly made a threatening gesture with his hand and fingers indicating that he was pointing a gun at Cheryl. Now, this one stopped me and had me really thinking because I'm thinking of a threatening gesture. I'm thinking of making that gun sign. I'm thinking of someone that age, someone who is a member of the criminal justice system. And I'm thinking that that is not the kind of behavior that you're expecting. And it's definitely not the kind of behavior that you're expecting in a public space. What is going wrong with mm-hmm. this couple or what has gone wrong? You, well, see that. I, you know, my suspicion is that not only is this judge arrogant, but as a judge, You know, I think he's used to living the world by telling others what they can and cannot do. I don't know. This is what I'm thinking here. This is a man who 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 reeks of of privilege. It's about privilege and it's about power. It's about power. And it always comes down to that. Yeah. So they get back home and Cheryl reportedly said something to the effect of, quote, quoting now, well, why don't you point a real gun at me? Not a good move on Cheryl's part. I'm going to agree there. Going to agree there. Not helping the situation. However, however, that doesn't mean that you should listen to her. <laughs> well, definitely, because when you think about it, it's sort of like a threat to masculinity. Uh, saying, if you think you are that powerful, why don't you do what you probably have been saying? And that's that dress rehearsal that we see in words to the violent act. Of course, it was a gross miscalculation on the part of the victim, but maybe uh, that kind of interaction, that kind of threatening behavior between the two of them is something that has been happening for a long time. And I guess this time, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's like calling a bluff and then... Yeah. That's, that's what I think. I think that they've been down this road before. It just feels mm-hmm. that way. So then the judge allegedly grabbed his Glock from a holster he had around his ankle and shot Cheryl in the chest. That is what prosecutors are saying happened. Then, this of course is my absolute, like, the part I can't get over. Then, Jeffrey, I mean, if your wife, your wife has just been shot, who then texts a confession to to two people who are part of that whole court system off a bailiff is an officer of the court. This is, is, they are duty bound to report such a thing. So Jeffrey allegedly then texted the court clerk and the bailiff saying, quote, I just lost it. I just shot my wife. I won't be in tomorrow. I will be in custody. I'm so sorry. Wow. Wow. There's so many ways to look at that. You know, you look at that as though it could be a confession. You look at it again, always. Sometimes when people are shot, they just do things that you're not expecting them to do. And you also look at it in this case that this individual really understands the uh, legal system. And I hope uh, so. <laughs> he, he just did what, what he was supposed to do. But when you also think about it, it, it really feeds into this psychology of sort of arrogance and narcissism and and power and, and privilege and and uh, something as nonchalant as a text uh, when you're thinking uh, who's calling, uh, you know, for sort of medical uh, treatment. Uh, this is something that has happened in the home. This is extraordinary trauma. This is your wife. Wow. I know. I know. It's that to me is the most telling part of this whole case is that text message that in the middle of this trauma that he takes a beat and and manages 
manages to get it all out half the time with my fat fingers. I, you know, my messages don't even make sense. And I'm, when I'm all, you know, stressed out, I no. it was like very calmly gets his message out. I, I find that fascinating. So Jeffrey reportedly called 911 himself, but here's the part Renee, I can't understand. Okay. So police are saying that in the 911 call, he was deliberately vague about what had happened. In the text message, he's absolutely direct. There is nothing vague about it. I shot her. She's dead. But, and I won't be in tomorrow. For the 911 call, who's on, which is the most important part of this whole thing, is to try and get her help to see if she can be saved. He's vague. Dispatchers are always asking questions like, what happened? Blah, 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 right? And, and in... Instead, and when asked if he had shot his wife, police say he alleged that he didn't want to talk about it at the time and reiterated that his wife needed medical attention. So here we, he's being the judge again. Listen, you 911 operator, don't you question me. I'm the judge. Comes back always to power. And of course it comes back to the details comes back to the details and also comes back to to uh, whether or not at that time. Now, I, I don't know if the text was before uh, the call uh, to uh, for medical treatment, uh, but if you think the text happened first and the call for medical treatment happened after, sometimes, as I say, you know, first it's shot and then your, your senses uh, get the better of you. And now you're realizing, hey, uh, you know, this matter is, is definitely uh, a criminal matter. I think a judge understands uh, all those questions around uh, evidence and questions around how uh, damaging uh, details could be. So uh, much going on in the mind of this individual. For me, I think what creates uh, a challenge is not only the age of the couple, but the years of marriage. And you ask yourself, if years of marriage ends like this, what was that marriage like? Oh. So sad. And they have two adult sons. And one of the sons, who's in his 20s, was home at the time. And he called 911 as well. But he told dispatchers that his father had been drinking too much and had just shot his mom. And you get a sense it's, it's, it's something that he's very familiar with. Uh, you get a sense, particularly when that kind of violence happens in a home, it didn't begin yesterday or the day of, of the violence. It's, it's something that uh, many children are exposed to, and particularly over a, an extended period of time. So when you have an adult son who just calls it as, as it is, and of course he put in uh, something that's very uh, concerning there, the drinking, of course, coming home, the arguing, and of course, uh, something that ends in murder. Um, we've got to think critically about intimate partner violence. We've got to think critically as a society about family and domestic violence. These things are very, very real and creates extraordinary intergenerational trauma that you know really, really is as painful as the 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 end result itself. And I, you know, I suspect here. I've already said that I'm uncomfortable with the fact that you know he's. I feel he's he's privileged and he's getting out on bail when others can't. I know he has the money, but I do feel because of his position, there has been some special treatment. Well, this next thing to me is a very strong indicator of special treatment. The son has said to the dispatcher that his father had been drinking. When the police arrive, they say that they can smell alcohol, but the test to determine how much alcohol is in the judge's system is not done for seven hours. Again, Renee, help me through this one. Well, that one, again, I, you know, I'm reading these things and I'm listening to you saying it again, and it really put me on pause because I was saying, why? Why so long? What is the reason for that? Of course, we know what the reason could be. We're only, of course, uh, speculating, but it comes back. It comes back to power and it comes back to privilege and it comes back to who has the authority to make the kinds of decisions and whether or not uh, the criminal justice system is really an equal system or it's a system that really works in the favor of certain other kinds of characteristics and, of course, kinds of systemic uh, issues that we are seeing in there. 
Oh, this to me is so troubling. So the police respond and they get there just after 8 p.m. Um, at this point, Cheryl is pronounced dead at the scene. So the judge, Jeffrey Ferguson, is arrested on the murder charge on the spot. Now, according to police, Jeffrey smelled of alcohol when the officers arrived and reportedly said, oh man, I can't believe I did this. Again, not exactly the, oh my God, what have I done? As opposed to, I can't believe I did this. Okay, that is disturbing. Then officers finally tested Jeffrey's blood alcohol level level seven hours later, which I think is an abuse right here. That is not fair at all. And oh, and how did the blood alcohol test come back? Oh, he was under the legal limit. He wasn't drunk anymore because he was at 0 0.06. Hmm. Yeah, seven hours later. Almost definitely. And it's a combination of, of that sort of lethal arrogance. And then you ask yourself, given his standing in that community, what kind of relationship he may have had with law enforcement in that community as well. And oftentimes that relationship across the criminal justice pipeline between uh, law enforcement and a judge, you know, there are relationships in there that we may not understand. Unfortunately, those are some of the relationships that provide a particular kind of space for a particular kind of oftentimes something viewed as injustice uh, to really happen. Why wait I, that long? What, 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 what was the reason? There was no reason. There was absolutely no reason. There's absolutely no reason to wait that long whatsoever. You know, he's he's already said to officers, oh boy, I can't believe I did this. He's arrested. He should have been tested immediately to preserve all the evidence possible. Now, I will admit it's pretty unusual for a judge to be charged with this level of crime. It's one of the reasons we're looking at it, but I found it far more interesting because of the text messages and the things that he allegedly said to me says so much more about this case and how the justice system in this area is, is dealing with this case. So after his arrest, officers executed a search warrant on their home and they allegedly recovered 47 weapons, including rifles, shotguns, handguns, including the pistol that was allegedly used in the shooting, along with 26,000 rounds of ammunition. That's an awful lot of ammunition. According to police, all these weapons were legally registered to Jeffrey, and officers also allege that there was a 22 rifle, which was also registered to Jeffrey at the time of the shooting, but for some reason is unaccounted for. I don't know what that means. It could mean something. It could mean nothing. Uh, more on the judge. Okay, here's what I find interesting, Renee. So this is a man with a very long legal career in history in Orange County. He began working in the district attorney's office back in 1983. He was even president of the local bar association. In 2015, he became a superior court judge handling criminal cases in Fullerton. The two of them married in 1996. Cheryl had worked in the probation departments of Santa Barbara and Orange counties. She later worked for 20 years for American Funds Service Company before leaving to become a full-time mom. Uh, the couple lived in Anaheim Hills where... They had lived in that home for 20 years and they had two adult sons. So Jeffrey gets released one day after his arrest on a million dollars bail. And because of all of his professional relationships in Orange County, the case has been moved to Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. Now, what is not absolutely clear to me is I do not believe that the Orange County DA's office or that local police should be the lead investigators on this case because the judge was involved with all of these departments. Most definitely, most definitely relationships, intertwined relationships there in criminal justice, what we also refer to as incestuous relationships across the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, whether or not uh, we know it, it, it shouldn't happen, but it's also the reality of the fact that if you're working in the criminal justice system, you are going to meet people along the way. Uh, I think for me, the other question was just like uh, moving the case to somewhere else. And I'm thinking in this day and age of social media, 
you could move it to another planet. You know, once people have technology, they are going to know what's going on and they are going to get involved in it. This is a very, very, very troubling uh, case for me on just so many different levels. Uh, the power, the prestige, the sort of lethal arrogance uh, that we see. And also when we think about family violence and the fact that it could happen in a young home where there are no resources and it could happen in a home like this where you have access, you have opportunity, you have resources, you have life experience, you have power, and you're also uh, a member of the community that people look up to. Oh, he should have known better. I mean, it's as simple as that. He absolutely, of all people, should have known that there are far better solutions to an argument than to kill someone. And he is the one who allegedly did that, even though even though these text messages are very incriminating, his statements are incriminating, he has entered a not guilty plea. So there are some conditions to his release. So this one I find interesting. Jeffrey <laughs> cannot drink alcohol or visit any place where alcohol is the primary business. Hello, why didn't you test the man seven hours earlier? This is earlier? what I'm thinking. <laughs> what? So we know alcohol is a, is a problem. You know alcohol is a problem in, in this situation. Clearly, clearly. So that's very telling. Also, he cannot go to a bar. He cannot go to a liquor store. He's barred from possessing any weapons or ammunition. Okay, that's reasonable. Um, he's required to wear a GPS device and remain in orange Riverside and LA counties and that the judge must surrender his passport. That sounds like a lot of moving around there for the judge. Not sure what kind of business he's into and why he needs that kind of a social bandwidth when the day comes. But, uh, you know, we don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no. Back to the judge and his arrogance. So prosecutors requested that the judge have no contact with his son, the one that was present, the one who is a witness to this case. <laughs> the judge said no. <laughs> his defense said absolutely not. And I guess they, I guess the judge overseeing his case said, okay, you're fine. <laughs> it's okay. You can talk to your son, our primary witness. Wow, Privilege? wow, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So the defense attorney for the judge who is now putting out a different narrative than the judge put out himself, says that the shooting was, quote, unintentional, and it was accidental. The defense attorney made a statement saying that there was no intent to kill, there was no malice, and they will find him not guilty. That this wasn't a crime, it was accidental. Really? Wow. Sure. Okay. Okay. So Jeffrey's next court date is scheduled for October 30th. Now back to Cheryl, the victim here. She has already been buried um, with her family. And the family has had a few comments, not too much. They, of course, say this is a horrific tragedy for their family. Her brother made a very curious comment to the LA Times about the couple's relationship. The brother said, quote, there's going to be some stuff that will potentially come up. Yeah. All right. We're going to be watching this one. It is time for our comment section. These are the cases that you all are talking about on social media. And here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. How's it going? Good. Hey, Renee. Great to see you. Hi, Will. Nice to meet you. <clears throat> so I, you weren't here with us last week, Renee, but last week we had a case where uh, an intruder tried to break in through a chimney and got stuck. This week, we have uh, an unwanted car crashing into the second story of a home. This case comes out of Decatur Township in Pennsylvania, where a 20-year-old man was arrested after he allegedly crashed his car into the second story of a home in what officers are now calling an intentional act. So according to the Pennsylvania State Police, this all happened uh, in the afternoon of August 6th, where troopers responded to a car crash as a re at a residence. Now, we got some photos of this. This comes from the Junction Fire Company, and uh, I, I'll, I'll show it here for the viewers. But for the listeners, there's a car crashed into the second story of this home. It's kind of at an angle. It's like a it's like a gray Toyota Corolla. Uh, obviously, the car's front grille and bumper are destroyed, but like this entire front window is smashed in. One of the walls of the home, and it's just 
It's it's sitting up on the second story of the house. It's, it's very, very bizarre. I'm going to get into how this actually happened, the physics of that in just a second. The um, physics, yes. How did it get yeah. to the second story? This is the part of it's like a MacGyver move. I don't yes, understand. Yes. So this house is like it's the, the car is wedged in the second story of this house. It allegedly took them a couple of hours to get this out. They had to be really careful, obvious, because they, they didn't want to do any structural damage to the home as they're removing this. And then like kind of like a, an insult to injury in this one is like firefighters put a tarp over the giant hole to uh, protect the house from any uh, impending storms. Now, when this happened, there were actually inhabitants at the home. Um, uh, we, we, I heard in an interview with uh, one of the people who lived there that a, a bunch of family members, some cousins and stuff were sitting on the bottom story of the home when this car crash happened. So one of the people who lived there said it was actually like really lucky because had the car gone into that first floor, um, th there most certainly would have been some some injuries or possibly even casualties. Luckily, uh, no one, none of the people who lived in the home were seriously injured in this. Um, so when firefighters responded, the suspect was not in the car. Uh, he was kind of, they found him later, like running around claiming that he saw demons. Uh, he also allegedly said that he believed that he was a demon. So the driver here, uh, Evan Miller, uh, was transported to a nearby hospital for his injuries. He apparently made some animal like noises, uh, and kicked a security guard in the process. But how this all sort of went down, because I feel like this is the most interesting part. Officials believe that Miller here uh, was driving around 90 to 100 miles an hour when he crashed. And there's sort of a, an embankment outside the house. And they believe that when he hit that, it propelled him with enough speed to go up into the second floor of this house. So people kind of commented. I'll show the picture again. There's like some very tall sunflowers out front. And like he completely cleared those on his way to the second uh, to the second story there. So the driver here, Evan Miller, is facing eight charges, including including aggravated assault, careless driving, reckless driving, recklessly endangering another person, and more. Now, so uh, according to uh, officials, Miller was, this was a, an attempt at self-harm due to a mental health episode, and it just kind of like evolved in this thing. Um, we'll see what charges end up, end up being pressed uh, and, and how this all proceeds. But uh, just a very, very bizarre story, very, very bizarre uh, way for this all to happen. Luckily, like I said, nobody was seriously injured in this. It, it certainly from the pictures seems like it could have been much, much worse. Uh, but people in the comments had a lot to say about this one. Drastic said, if that was my house, I'd leave the car there. It looks dope. Uh, I, I I mean, it, it is so bizarre. It almost it seems like something out of a movie or, yeah. or or a stunt thing. It seems like something you would you would expect Tom Cruise to be behind the wheel or something. It's not not like a regular person. Patricia A said, yeah, only demons could have accomplished something so spectacularly non-human. Um, yeah, I don't know about the forces that be there, but I do say it, it is really lucky that no one was seriously injured in this. Guard mom had a great one. They said, so now we need no parking signs on our second floor windows. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you don't want somebody posted up there. Uh, <clears throat> Tina M said, this is what we in the South call a hold my beer moment, which unclear <laughs> if, if any intoxication was going on there. But uh, yeah, that it, it, it's a wild one. Per uh, 453 had my favorite comment. They said the Wright brothers crashed several times before they got their first flight. No judgment here which um, hopefully this suspect doesn't take flight again. As we said, this is all alleged, um, only charged here. Okay, so how did he get out of the car? Was he in the car when it went so into the second? It had to have been, but I can't find anything. Like, I don't know if he just like jumped down. Like I've seen the reports that he was like running around and, and, and sort of, you know, um, going through a, a mental health episode, but it's unclear like exactly how he how he got from the second floor down to the ground floor when when they responded. Wow. That is so interesting. So Renee, when someone is having an episode like this, you know, we talk about adrenaline and things that people can do. I mean, it's, is it plausible that he could have driven it and then gotten out of the car from the second floor and have been relatively not too injured? Uh, most definitely. I mean, this is a spectacular kind of a scenario. But when you're thinking about a mental health crisis and you're thinking about the individual, the individual is not uh, really of, of you know, of, of sound mind. So there's adrenaline, there's, uh, you know, you're just feeling hyped. And then there's the psychology of all these other things uh, that, that are coming together. You also have to think about whether or not the individual was on some sort of medication. Uh, that uh, is also a critical aspect that what could be happening there where, uh, you know, the adrenaline even feels uh, more forceful, more excitement, and uh, there's a kind of rush and of course, uh, there's that feeling of invincibility that we have seen many times with uh, uh, mental health episodes and crises. 
Wow. What, what an unusual one. That photo is amazing. For those of you listening, if you can see the photo at some point, it is almost hard to believe how this landed into the second floor. It's just really stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a wild one, but like we said, luckily no one was hurt. Um, that'll do it for this week's comment section. Uh, thank you so much. Everybody who left those, you can do those over on our YouTube community page. We're also on, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, that'll do it for this week. I'll see y'all next week. Bye. Will. Bye. Renee, it has been such a pleasure talking with you. I'm so excited. I feel like I've gone full circle from watching you on television, doing your commentary to coming on our program. We're so blessed to have you. Where can people follow you or are, if they're interested, if you um, have social media or a website, where can people find you? Sure. Thank you, of course, for inviting me. You can find me at the University of Virginia's website. I'm also on LinkedIn and on Instagram. I am real-time criminologist, so you can find me there as well. It has been such a pleasure and such an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I just love the magic of just like sitting there watching someone on TV and then saying, we need to get her. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You can find me at Anna G News on all the socials, Anna with one N. You can find this episode of the podcast wherever you all get your podcasts. You can also subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to watch us instead of just listening and subscribe to our newsletter or truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs> <laughs>